The word of the Lord is as follows. And those of you who don't mind standing for the reading of the word of God, we ask that you'll stand now. All right, somebody got their thing going. (laughs) 41, beginning with verse 37. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you. Only I sitting on my throne will have a rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. Wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zaphonath Paneah. He also gave him a wife whose name was Asenath. She was the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. So Joseph took charge of the entire land of Egypt. He was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he inspected the entire land of Egypt. As predicted, for seven years, the land produced bumper crops. During those years, Joseph gathered all the crops grown in Egypt and stored the grain from the surrounding fields and the cities. He piled up huge amounts of grain like sand on the seashore. Finally, he stopped keeping records because there was too much to measure. During this time, before the first of the famine years, two sons were born to Joseph and his wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. Joseph named his oldest son Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my troubles, and everyone in my father's family. Joseph named his second son Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my grief. Thus far, the word of the Lord. You may be seated. During this time, before the first of the famine years, two sons were born to Joseph and his wife Asana, the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. Joseph named his older son Manasseh. God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Joseph named his second son Ephraim. For he said, God has made me fruitful in this land of my grief. I want to deal with today transcending trauma. Transcending trauma. At this time, 21 years ago, the absolutely terrifying and unimaginable was being played out before all the world to see. Airplanes hijacked by radicalized terrorists hurled into the twin towers of the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania due to the heroism of passengers and crew. Images of chaos, confusion, 
desperation, disbelief, helplessness, and horror were etched upon our minds as we watched buildings reduced to rubble, people jumping to their deaths to avoid dying by fire, individuals on the ground covered by ash, walking aimlessly, not knowing what might fall next. Telephones were ringing off the hook, wondering where loved ones were, if loved ones were on flights, and if so, how were they? All pretense of American invincibility was shattered. Our defenses had been penetrated, exacting the intended purpose, calamity and terror. And with it, a whole generation has grown up in a post-9-11 world characterized by suspicion, phobia, and anxiety. A whole generation has been formed and shaped by trauma. And it is no surprise, then, that this generation, more than its predecessors, is talking openly about how anxious, how troubled they are. Trauma. Trauma is an emotional response to an injurious event. 9-11 was the event. And trauma, both individual and collective, arose from it. It's difficult to comprehend the full sweep of trauma that resulted from that day, in part being due to it being both individual and collective. 2,977 people died on September 11th. But more people have died from the toxic exposure created by September 11th than those who died in the September 11th attacks. 4,343 survivors and first responders have died in the years since 9-11. More than 19,000 members of the World Trade Center Health Program have been officially diagnosed with one or more mental health conditions, including 638 members who are now deceased. And attached to each of these deaths, Attached to each of these diagnoses are family and friends. They are spouses, fiancés, parents, children, grandchildren, cousins, nieces, nephews, friends whose hearts were shattered by their loved ones' immediate and protracted deaths. Can you imagine planning a wedding one day and the fiancé is gone the same day? To be with child and the father is gone, or to be a child and a parent or both parents are gone? What must it have been like to have made plans for lunch or dinner, to have an appointment for later in that day, all for that to be shattered in a moment by a radical and hate? The layers and levels of trauma are profound. And can you further imagine having to live with it every year as coverage occurs throughout all forms of media? Every year seeing the towers fall, every year seeing the pen, every, every year. Week before last, I was touched by the stories of several persons directly impacted by 9-11 and loss. They shared their stories of deep wounding, profound pain, and of God's work in their lives. They gave glimpses of what it means to transcend trauma. Their lives and what they've chosen to do with their lives reveals the capacity to transcend trauma. I raised this before us, not simply in the remembrance of what happened on this day 21 years ago, but also in the recognition that there are many wrestling with trauma right now. 
There are those who've suffered a 9-11 in their own lives. No, it has not been a plane crashing into a tower, but there's been a crash in their own lives. The calamitous has come to their address and has visited them with death and disappointment. I may be looking at some right now. The wounds are fresh. The pain is deep. The angst is real. The event has passed but the memories and the feelings are as fresh as yesterday. The trauma is real. And the temptation to give in to the angst and anger is strong. The desire to exact some pain upon others is appealing. The pull to the self-destructive or destructive acts is compelling. Resignation, avoidance, checking out are tempting responses to Trauma and the wounds. Anybody know trauma? Anybody wrestling with some sort of PTSD? Anybody fighting with thoughts and feelings about something that happened, something that was said, something that was not prevented that has hurt or wounded you? If, if, if any of that is true, you've got trauma. And the question is, how do you transcend trauma? How do you get past it? How do you get over it? How, how do you overcome it in a positive way? How, how do you become the youngest principal in a school system's history? How do you transcend trauma? I, I, I'm, I'm particularly taken by the story of Joseph and the articulation of his transcending his Trauma. His was a multi-layered experience of traumatic events. I mean, think about it. There was the hatred of his brothers and their selling him into Ishmaelite slavery. There was the sexual harassment and false accusation by Potiphar's wife. There's Potiphar's wrongful imprisoning him. There's the forgetfulness of the chief cupbearer. The first trauma, being hated and sold by your brothers would have been enough for a lifetime. But he experienced compounded trauma. And yet the text reveals that the first trauma is the real challenge for him. The first trauma presented the deepest occasion of wounding. And the other traumas that came were consequences of the first. Because had his brothers not hated him and sold him to the Ishmaelites, he never would have entered Egypt, never would have been bought by Potiphar, never would have been harassed by Potiphar's wife, never would have been imprisoned by Potiphar, never would have been forgotten by the chief cupbearer. All those were the results of his having been sold by his brothers. The original trauma, that trauma was ever present before him. And while this is so, in our text, we see Joseph at a point of thriving. He is second only to Pharaoh, administering an initiative that would sustain Egypt and the known world around them. He is living within the purpose God established before his birth. And as significant as that may be, what is more significant is the work that God has done within Joseph. What is more significant than people bowing to Joseph is what God has caused to bow in Joseph. It is revealed in the naming of his firstborn son. He says, Manasseh. God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. And Ephraim, the second son, God has prospered me in the land of my grief. Regardless of the height to which Joseph had ascended, there was still the trauma of his brother's actions and the fallout from it. There are many whose external functioning betrays the reality of trauma resulting from profound wounds. I just want you to think, think about Individuals who on the outside had achieved great amounts of success. 
and yet whose tragic deaths reveal the inner trauma that they never got over. Think about Donnie Hathaway, Phyllis Hyman. Think about Whitney Houston. And the list goes on and on. People who, who ascended to the, to the heights of their professions, admired by millions, but dealing with inner trauma that they never got over. They give themselves fully to the roles assigned while silently bearing the pain of cloudy days, sleepless nights, drinking, drugging, sexing, doing whatever to, to try to calm the noise that's going on on the inside. Something happens within Joseph at the birth of the first son he says, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Had Joseph not, not named the boy that name, we'd never get a glimpse of what was going on with Joseph. Joseph was troubled by his troubles. He was troubled by his thoughts about his brothers. So troubled was he by them, if you notice, he does not even mention them as his brothers. He calls them his father's family. You, you, know, how, you, you know how it gets when, when somebody gets on your nerves and you say, that's yours? That's your, that's your wife. That's your husband. That's your daughter. That's your son. Jo jo Joseph doesn't claim, claim them. He puts it on his daddy, my, my father's family. As present and as painful as that may have been, Joseph says, God made me forget. God doesn't erase the troubles. God does not eliminate Joseph's brothers. God changes Joseph's relationship with thoughts about the troubles and thoughts with the brother. God makes him forget. And the word for forget in this case does not mean that you lose memory. Now, he doesn't get amnesia, dementia, or Alzheimer's. The word for forget means to discount, to reduce the weight, to lessen in view and consequences. God changes how Joseph relates and remembers his trouble. Friends, you'll never be able to outrun your troubles. You'll never be able to escape. But God can change how you relate to your troubles. In psychology, there is a process called memory reconsolidation. Tondra, I just want you to know I'm in your field now. Memory reconsolidation where previously held memories and the emotions around them are modified by the introduction of a completely new thought or new learning. The Bible puts it like this, taking every thought captive and making it obedient to the knowledge of God. What was the new thought? What was the new learning that God introduced to Joseph? Well, the new thought, the new learning begins with introducing a different main character to the story. Joseph's transcending his trauma begins with his recognition of the presence and activity of God. When he names this, this boy, the firstborn, he names him and the first word of the name is God. God has made me forget. Joseph's reconsolidation begins with the inclusion of God in the scenes, not as a bystander, not as an observer, but God is the main character in the story. You see, oftentimes, trauma continues because we're focusing on the characters who wound us, the people who betray us, the people who hurt us. And they become the main characters in the drama. And for as long as the, the, 
the one who wounded you is the main character, you'll never get over your trauma. Joseph says, I'm introducing another character because they don't deserve to be the main character. Somebody else was in the story. Joseph was not alone in the troubles. God was there. And God has been with him, not as prevention from trauma, but as presence with, sufferer with, wounded with, disturbed with, shaken with. Friends, transcending trauma requires seeing God, the presence of God with you in the traumatic. You got to see God there as painful as ugly as it may have been and as isolated as you may have felt, you were not alone. God was there. He was there with you. And here's, here's the thing. The God who allows the traumatic is the God who is personally accountable within the traumatic. What do I mean? Whatever God allows to come your way, God is accountable for you and with you in what comes your way. And God's accountability demands that God be present. That God has to be present in what God does not prevent. God feels what God did not prevent. God suffers what God does not prevent. God is pain over what God does not prevent. Whatever trauma we sit with, we do not sit alone. God sits with us. And with that, here it is, he kept what he did not prevent from being worse. Now you may wonder how it could have been worse. Well, more than just one or two relatives could have died in 9-11. Whatever was traumatic, it could have killed you. The one who kept it from being worse is the one who kept you in the midst. And I wonder, is there anybody who knows that whatever it was, it could have been worse? And that the one who drew the line in the sand was the one who was with you as it was being played out. From the text, the new thought continues with the sight of, of Manasseh, looking at his now life with Asenath and Manasseh, and later with Ephraim, put his life in another perspective. Because God's present was more than his past. And friends, understand this, transcending trauma requires an awakening from the nightmare of the past to the blessing in the present. It requires an awakening from the nightmare of the past to the blessing of the present. Prior to Manasseh's birth, Joseph's thoughts were locked into what was past to him. He was living his present with thoughts of his past. And even though things were going well for him in his present, he couldn't stop thinking about his past. The past was the interpretive lens of his life. The past spoke of his pain even though he was living in prosperity. And therefore, he viewed his life from the perspective of his pain. But the birth of Manasseh awakens him to the fact that he is not living in his past. Manasseh shakes him into being present for his present. Manasseh causes him to realize he's not in the house of Jacob. He's in the palace of Pharaoh. And therefore, a new thought is introduced. A new perspective is introduced. A competing interpretation of his life is introduced. He is forced to acknowledge that his life hasn't all been lost. It hasn't all been tragedy. It hasn't all been deprivation. In fact, his past may have been lost, but his present is gain. His past may have been deprivation, but his present is provision. His past may have been one of scarcity, but his present is one of abundance. 
you know, there, there, are, there, are, there are those who, who can't get out of their past. There, 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 are, there are those who, who have abundance, but they're still living a scarcity life. Because they have not been awakened to the fact that the nightmare of scarcity is over. What, what still has you? What still is holding you? What still is shaping you by way of your past that you cannot live and enjoy the present? The, moreover, the introduction of the new empowers him to acknowledge that the ugliness of the past has not stopped him from reaching the beauty of his present. The Lord has made me fruitful. The land of my grief. His past did not have the power to stop him from reaching his present. And with such a realization, Joseph is able to discount the power and weight of the past. He realizes it doesn't deserve the amount of attention that he's been given. It does not need to occupy the amount of space that it has been occupying. Transcending trauma requires us to acknowledge that our lives are more than the pain of the past. That God attunes us to blessing in the present to awaken us from the nightmares of the past. And the blessing provides a competing thought that reconsolidates the memory and our relationship with it. It tells us that as painful and as nightmarish as it was, our lives have not been perpetually asleep in the nightmare. It didn't have the power to keep us in it. It didn't have the power to destroy. It hasn't had the power to prevent God from blessing you. And since it hasn't had the power to do that, it does not deserve the power to mess up your day does not deserve the power to cloud your mind, does not deserve the power to steal your joy. And somebody ought to be about to shout over the simple fact that God brought you past your nightmare and God wakened you to see another day, another week, another month, another year, another decade. You are not in the nightmare. God brought you out the nightmare. God brought you through the nightmare. God brought you past. The night. You are not in the nightmare anymore. Hallelujah. 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 Freddy, Freddy Krueger and the bride of Chucky, they're gone. You're not in that nightmare. Nightmares pass. God has you in the present. God is blessing you. But then thirdly, transcending trauma requires Seeing yourself differently. When Joseph was stuck in the nightmare of a troubled past, he was stuck not just in the memory of what happened, but also in an interpreted identity. Stuck in the memory of his father's house with his father's family, he was stuck in the identity of a forgotten son and a hated brother. He's been out of that location for over 15 years, yet he was still stuck in seeing himself in that location. His life is large in Egypt, but his memory has him cramped in the pit where his brothers put him. The birth of Manasseh awakens him to a new identity. He is a loving husband, and he's a trusted father. And with this new thought, he forgets, he discounts the hatred of his brothers and the absence of his father. He chooses to be present to what God has made him to be and who God is making him to become. What his past spoke of his being hated, his presence speaks of his being loved and respected and needed. You, you see, trauma has a way of shaping us and causing us to see ourselves from the lens of the wound. We see ourselves as victim. 
We see ourselves as abused. We see ourselves as unloved. We see ourselves as not wanted. We, that's how we identify our, ourselves. And, and we can be in, in relationships with people who love us and we still doubt their love because we're still looking at ourselves as unloved rather than capable of being loved. Transcending the trauma requires seeing ourselves differently. We're more than the experience of the womb. And for somebody, transcending trauma requires seeing yourself as more than the neglected or the abused child, more than the person whose contributions were overlooked, more than the person who was betrayed or cheated on, more than the person who was abandoned and left behind. You are more than the person bearing the consequences of a bad choice. You are more than the person whose loved one died prematurely or tragically. You are more than what happened to you, or you, and you are more than what did not come your way. You are more than the person in that event. That event was never the whole of you. You were more than the event when the event occurred. You are the person who is loved, the person upon whom people now depend and rely, the one whose thoughts are sought, the one who protects people from abuse. You are the one who counsels people, the one who mentors others to keep themselves from making the same mistakes. You're more than that. Joseph is no longer defined by his troubles. He's more than. But somebody right now, God is saying to you, you are more than. You are more than what happened. You are more than how it impacted. You are more than that. And here it is, with you being more than, you need to know that God has more than in mind for you. That God, God, God has more in mind for you. God gave Joseph a dream as a boy that he would exceed his brothers and his father, that they would bow down to him. Joseph's destiny was to be more than where he was. Now, here it is. What was not clear in the vision was the location of the dream and the dream was limited in terms of who would be bowing down to Joseph. The dream only has brothers and father bowing down. Doesn't show where he's going to be. But if you were listening to the text as I read it, the edict, the order of Pharaoh in Egypt is that everybody bows to Joseph in Egypt. The, the, the dream only has that of brothers, but the reality is more than the brothers. I'm going to hit you in a minute. The story reveals that Joseph's troubles were the pathway through and to his destiny. That every traumatic experience led him closer to destiny. That as painful as they may have been, God used each one of them to further his purpose for Joseph. And Joseph would tell his brothers later that what you meant for evil, God, meant, God worked for good to save those that are alive. And after Manasseh is born, God continues to bless Joseph with another son that Joseph names Ephraim, meaning double prosperity, and causing Joseph to say, God has prospered me in the land of my sorrows. What I'm trying to get somebody to understand is transcending trauma requires seeing God creating a future that is greater than your past. That the dreams that God has even shown you don't even include all that God has for you. Because Joseph's dream only saw his family bowing when God had in mind a nation bowing. God, in, in the dream, it had Joseph where he was, but God said, no, I'm going to put you as second under Pharaoh in the most powerful nation of the world. And the pathway to get there is going to be some trouble. 
I guess what I'm trying to let somebody understand is that the pathway to the future is not away from the traumatic. It is through the traumatic events of life. The you of your future and the future that is for you includes some trauma. But if it is his purpose for your life, if it is God's path for your life, then you need to know you have God's presence and you have God's power to come through the path and to get to the purpose. Lord have mercy. I believe I'm just trying to let somebody know you got to go through the path to get to your purpose. And your path may have some trauma, but your purpose is greater than the trauma. And the God who has your path and your purpose has power to get you through it all. Can I talk to somebody? Look at Israel. Do you see the trauma of being hemmed in by the Egyptians at the Red Sea? But do you see God's presence and God's power with them bringing them through, causing the waters to part, dry land to appear? And then when they get to the other side, the waters drown Pharaoh and his army. Look at Naomi and the trauma and the trauma of exile in a foreign land, losing her husband and losing her sons. But do you see God with her in the midst giving her Ruth as a daughter-in-law who has suffered the trauma of losing a husband but then God announces bread back in Bethlehem creates favor for Ruth with Boaz and sets up the continuance of the line of Jesus with Ruth being the grandmother of David look at David and witness his trauma his brothers hated on him Saul tried to kill him Doeg betrayed him Michal his wife despised him his own failure with Bathsheba his sons rebelled his best friend's betrayal but look at God in the midst making him Israel's greatest king and a man after God's own heart there is always the path and the path may have trauma in it but the purpose is always greater than the trauma in the past can I pull up one more witness come here Jesus you were hunted as an infant you were made a refugee as a toddler you were marginalized by Romans you were tempted by the devil in the wilderness you were misunderstood by your own family you are hounded and misrepresented by the religious you were betrayed by Judas denied by Peter forsaken by the eleven mistried by the Sanhedrin beaten by soldiers rejected by your own people crucified on a cross felt forsaken of God but each traumatic experience furthered God's purpose the chief priest plot Judas's betrayal the people's lies the crowd's cry of crucifixion each led to Jesus fulfilling his purpose and included in their purpose was Jesus bearing our griefs and Jesus carrying our sorrows. I want you to know his trauma included our trauma. He died with our trauma but then early Sunday morning God raised him from the dead victorious not just over death, hell and the grave but also over every bit of trauma that could ever be imagined. He transcended the trauma and because Jesus transcended the trauma those in Jesus are able to transcend their trauma the one who bore our sins is the one who bore our pain he wasn't just our sin bearer he was our pain bearer he was our burden bearer he was our trauma bearer the elders were right when they would pray and you know we mocked them when they prayed the prayer but they would say you are your burden bearer and you're a heavy load sharer but I want you to know that they weren't just saying it. They knew what they were talking about. And I wonder if I'm talking to anybody who's had some burdens, who's had some heavy loads, but you're able to testify that he is your burden bearer. He is your heavy load sharer. He is your heart fixer. He is your mind regulator. He is the one who dries your tears. He is the one who lifts up your head. hallelujah oh hallelujah I thank him for taking my sins but I'm so glad he takes my trouble as well he takes my pain he takes my sorrow he takes my grief he takes it all and that God is right here right now he's right here right now He's right here right now and he invites you to lay down the burdens you're carrying. He invites you to lay down the heavy load. 
He invites you to lay down that grief. He invites you to lay it down at his feet. Because he's the one who carries it. Oh, hallelujah. He's the one who carries it. 